Father, we thank you for this, another opportunity to minister to these, your precious sheep. Thank you, Lord, that revelation knowledge will flow freely, uninterrupted and unhindered by any satanic or demonic force. And Father, I ask that you will speak through my vocal cords and think through my mind, none of me. And all of you, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. amen. You may be seated. We started this series, uh, I don't even know when, but I ain't, you know, but, but we, we're going to pick up where we left off, <laughs> okay? We'll pick up where we left off. Now, remember what we're doing in, in the study of the book of John. We're just digging deep. I'm not rushing through uh, certain principles. We're taking our time and just kind of camping out there. And tonight, I want to talk to you about something that's pretty fascinating. I call this a living revelation of God versus a letter written in stone. A living revelation of God versus a letter written in stone. And I want to start off in uh, St. John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, and then verse, uh, verse 14. Now this is this is pretty pretty amazing. So, uh, you know, I've, I've never even dug this deep to even take the time to look at what I'm about to show you tonight. But there is a huge huge difference, and a gigantic insult when somebody works real hard to go back to the letter after we have a living revelation that has been given to us. Verse one, Saint John one, verse one. He says, "In the beginning was the Word." Very familiar. But then he says, and the word was with God. But then he said, and the word was God. So we are talking about God. The word was God. We're not talking about, you know, uh, something that is expressing an idea or a thought between human beings. We're talking about God. And then in verse 2, he says, the same was in the beginning with God. So the Word, which is God, was in the beginning with God. But then in verse 14, he, he, he spells it out a little bit more in 14. Uh, John 1, 14, he says, and the Word was made flesh. The Word was made flesh. We call him Jesus, right? The Word was made flesh. And the word that was made flesh dwelt amongst us. The word that was made flesh dwelt amongst us. And we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father. And the word that was made flesh was full of grace and truth. The word that was made flesh, we, we call him Jesus, was full of grace and truth. If you understand that, say amen. So grace and truth came by the Word made flesh. Grace and truth came by the Word made flesh, and it was dwelling amongst men. It was, that Word that was made flesh, it was a living revelation of God. Now listen to that. The Word that was made flesh and the Word that was God, when Jesus showed up, they beheld a living revelation revelation or revealing or unfolding of God. In other words, when the word that was made flesh showed up, it's the first time man had ever uh, gained an idea of what God was like. L let me show you something here. Go to 2 Corinthians. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6 and 7. So it was a living revelation of God. Now, we are comparing this, 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 this living revelation of God to a letter written in stone. We're, we're comparing grace and law. The law is but the letter written and engraven in stone. The law was a letter. Letter letters written and engraven in stone. 
Say that again. The law was a letter, letters written and engraven in stone. Second Corinthians chapter 3, 6 says, who also have made us able ministers of the New Testament and not ministers of the letter written engraven in stone, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth. The letter killeth. And then it goes on to say, but the Spirit gives life, right? Uh, now, listen to me carefully now. Now, here, here's, what I'm, here's what I'm trying to demonstrate here. Let's look at this, uh, let's define a word so you can see literally what it is and we compare it to what we just read here. A word, like I said, is it is an expression of an idea or it's an expression of a thought. I have a thought. I use words to express it. I have an idea. I use words to express it. It conveys a complete idea from one person to another. I'm, I'm saying words to you right now. I am conveying an idea. I am conveying a thought from me to you. If you understand that, say amen. So the word that was with God and the word that was God conveys a full and adequate idea of God. The word, just like words that I'm speaking or I write in a letter, those words convey an idea or a thought. The word that was made flesh the word that was God has given to us the idea of God. Yeah. Oh, my God. Do, do you see what I'm saying? It gives us the idea of God. It gives us and it conveys a full and adequate idea of God because the word was made flesh. It dwelt amongst us. This idea of God was manifested to man in human terms, understandable to a man. This word that was made flesh, given to a man so they could behold it and see it. The, the, the scripture says in 1 John that we heard it, we held it, we, we, be, we beheld it. Now, please put yourself in a situation. Before Jesus, what is God like? Are, are you see what I'm saying? Before Jesus, what, what is, wh how, do you, how do you describe God? You ever had writings, but, but you're going to see the, the, the love of God. He says, what I want to do is the idea of God <clears throat> I'm going to allow it to become flesh. The idea of God has now become flesh, and you can behold him. Glory to God. So that which you beheld was God and is God. So if you want to talk, and we beheld his glory. So if you want to talk about God and you want to know what he's like, Jesus said, the Father and I are one. What else did he say? He said, when you see him, yeah. see, we need to quit this, man. This thing is already. All right, so if you understand all that, say amen. If you understand all that, let me, let me set this up. All right, 1 John 1 and 1. I was just reading King James. He says, that which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, ain't nobody saw God. But now we heard him. We saw him with our eyes, which we have looked upon. Our hands have handled the word of life. They said, our hands have handled the word of life. So truly the word dwelt amongst us that man may know God and knowing him have life. 
so he dwelt amongst us so we can know him, but not only so we can know him, so we can have something that only comes from him. Life. I know him. I have beheld him. And I have from him life. Now, let's compare that to the law. Because everything I just said is not so with the law. The law can convey no adequate idea of God. Think about it for a moment. The law conveys no idea, no adequate idea of God. Think for a moment. I'm getting ready to say something. I'm going to show you that you are not ever, even, ever, even, ever be tempted to go back to the law. It offers shame and guilt and condemnation and death. The law cannot give you life. Okay, being the letter, it is but elemental and it is incomplete. It does not reveal God to man. Uh, you can study all that may pertain to the law without ever coming to an understanding of God. Read it. Read it. All you're going to hear, all you're going to read is the condemnation that comes, the judgment that comes, the shame that comes. It is not going to give you anything that reveals God. If it was left up to the law, the law could have never revealed God to man. My gosh. So in it is found no revelation of his love. The law has no revelation of his love. None. It was engraven. Now, here's a, here's a clue. It was engraven and written upon stones, which symbolically is its inability to give life. Stones is like, you can't, it's dead, it's stone. You know, it's, it, it's, it's Medusa stones. You remember that in school? The lady with the snakes in her hair, you hold it up, you turn it into stone. There's no life there. It can't touch the hearts of men, nor can it be touched by the feelings of the infirmities of a man. The law can't touch your heart. The Bible says in Hebrews 4.15 that that Jesus is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He says, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all point tempted like as we are yet without sin. Jesus, he, he feels us, we feel his love, but not the law. The letter does not dwell among men. The letter can't do that. The letter's not wrapped up in flesh. It stands off. Yet men try... Uh, to find God, and they try to find life in the law. Reject Jesus, reject grace, go to the law, and they're trying to find life in the law. You can't. That's why if you, miss, miss, if you, if you dismiss Jesus and try to live your life by the law, there is no life in the law. Now, please don't misunderstand me. The law's not bad. It's just perfect. The better part is the word wrapped up in flesh coming down and showing you who he is. Yet men try. Romans chapter 1 and 18, I want to read this, what you find in the law. Romans 1, 18, he says, for the wrath of God, that's what's revealed in the law, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So, you find the demand for righteousness in the law. You find judgment because they fail to measure up to the righteousness and all that's all been demanded. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and 6 where it says the letter killeth, that's what he's talking about. The letter killeth, but the spirit brings life. Now just for a moment, I want to just take just a little... Uh, rabbit trail, and talk about how we should not desire to be under the law as many people do. Galatians chapter 4, 19. I want to read it in the King James and the NLT. 
Galatians 4, 9, King James and NLT. So it's not, it's not strange that Paul's writing to the Galatians who desired to be under the law. Here's what he said to the Galatians who wanted to be under the law. There are people today that want to be under the law. And as long as you're under the law, you can't see grace. You can't see life. Now, look what he says here. But now, after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto you desire again to be in bondage? Now, look at this in the NLT. There, <laughs> He's saying a guy that desires to go back to living your life under religious law, you, you just went back to bondage. I like what he says in the NLT. He says, so now that you know God, or should I say now that God knows you, <laughs> why do you want to go back again and become slaves once more to the weak and useless spiritual principles of this world? Why? I mean, every, 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 every pastor we have in our church is just preaching out of his guts the grace of God. And we are very blessed to have a, 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 a church that farms grace so you can harvest it, you know what I mean? But it's not so. so. And, and, and no matter how we preach it, man, we just preach it, we preach it, we preach it, we preach it. And there's somebody out there saying, well, I don't see it. That's because you're trying to get life from something that's dead to you. And, and, and that's what the law is. The word was full of grace and truth. Now, there's a very weird teaching that I'm sure you're familiar with where it associates grace with license. And you hear things like, grace is not a license to sin. I mean, that's, that's, that's a lot of, lot of things wrong with that, but a whole lot of people seem to be afraid of grace because they think it's going to teach and lead people into careless living because it, it's too good to be true news. I mean, you know, people already say about me, uh, Crevo Dollar be, be telling them people it's all right to sin. Ain't nobody said it's all right to sin. I'm just saying your way to try to get out of sin is not going to work. Because if you could have did it, Jesus didn't need to come and die on the cross. No, no, no. You, uh, I, you're never going to be free from the behavior of sin until you recognize you no longer have the sin nature. Victory over sinful behavior comes when you start realizing that you have been set free and totally delivered from the sin man, and that's not your nature no more. And every time after you get born again that you find yourself in bad behavior, you continue to remind yourself, what I just did is not my nature anymore. Amen. And you renew your mind with the Word of God so it can line up with your new nature, and you're going to find that you're going to start sinning less and less. Behavior starts lining up, and the day you believe your identity in Christ, that you are now the righteousness of God, and you have a new nature that desires to live right, a new nature that desires to live holy, then the behavior is going to have to line up with your new nature. And you look up one day and say, well, what happened to the behavior? It wasn't because you continue to insist on trying to handle your bad behavior through your self-effort, your self-discipline, and all that other kind of stuff. That's not how that's going to happen. It's going to happen when you believe that life comes from the Word that was made flesh. And the idea of God is that I love you so much that nobody else could deliver grace and truth. So I had to wrap myself up in flesh and bring to you this awesome grace and mercy and truth and get it to you and say, here, let it serve you, because that which, which, which you were in bondage to cannot give you what you're looking for. Let that settle for a moment. Let that settle for a moment. Let that settle for a moment. Ooh, Jesus. Y'all getting this? Other people would emphasize the fact that when grace is taught, I don't know if you've heard this. So people are afraid, you know, that, that grace teaching, you know, it's too, it's too, 
too much liberty. You, you need to preach sin. I don't know what, I don't, I don't know, I don't even understand. You need to preach sin. That's sin. Well, why didn't you, why couldn't Jesus heal everybody in the village? Sin, sin. <laughs> no, it wasn't. It was because their performance was, they thought that they could do it through their own self-performance and stuff like that. It's, and, 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 and I, I have to believe the scriptures, the scripture says, those who are in the law can't see grace. I was meditating on this scripture. I showed up Sunday and I kept saying, behold the lamb. Behold the lamb. And it hit me. Not until you stop beholding yourself. You can't behold the lamb if you got yourself in view. You got to get yourself out of the way. He said, behold the lamb. What he is saying is, would you please get all your effort and all of your stuff out of the way and behold the lamb. He is enough. Yes. Why? Because he is God. You have beheld him. You have heard him. You have, you, <laughs> you, 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 your eyes have beheld him. That's the idea of God. Not the one in Mount Sinai that said, don't touch the bottom of the mountain or you will fall dead. Behold the Lamb. Somebody asked me one time, what's the first thing I need to do after I get born again? Get to know Jesus. Yes. No, what do I need to read first? Okay, no, let's get to know Jesus. How? I want you to spend time with him. I want you to start off reading, reading this, this book we're teaching on tonight, the book of John. And I want you to get to know. I want you to see John, the revelator. John, the one who said he was, he was highly loved of God. I want, you to get, I want you to get to know him. I want you to see him. I want you to behold him. I want you to handle him. I want you to see his glory manifested in your life. Get to know him. So then when you run across a doctrine that tells you you're going to go to hell because you missed it somewhere, then you'll know that ain't God. Right. How many of you knew before you heard this gospel of grace, certain things happened in your life, and you, you, you said to yourself, I, that can't be God. Yes. Yes. That can't be God. I, I just, I just, you just know. And then when you heard grace and, and, you, and, you, and you were able to see it, and it, you're like, that's the God I always knew he was. When you heard about he was rich in mercy, that's the God you always knew he was. I mean, under, under, the, under that religion we were under, it was quick to send us to hell on a daily basis. <laughs> you're going to hell for that, you're going to hell for that, you're going to hell for that. Do you agree? Well, you're going to hell for not agreeing with me. <laughs> and I'm like, where, where is this God? And every time I looked at Jesus and studied Jesus and saw what Jesus was doing, I saw the Father who was rich in mercy. A Jesus that when they took a woman right out of a bed of adultery and they threw her in front of all these religious people and they were ready to keep the rule and stone her. And they mentioned the rule of Jesus. You know, Jesus, the law of Moses said that if you catch this woman in adultery, she should be stoned. That's what he said. Hallelujah. But the word wrapped up in flesh said, because it says, I'm here to fulfill every jot and tittle of the law. So I'm not going to disagree with you because you're going to catch me in something. I'm, I'm not going to disagree with you. What I'm going to ask you is this. I want you to look a little deeper than your rule. You who have no sin yourself, cast the first stone. And all the old folks left real quick. And the young ones hung around a little bit. And they eventually left. Are you listening to what I'm saying here? We beheld him. Getting this gospel of grace out has been one of the greatest honors of my life, but also one of the greatest frustrations of my life. I just figure, this is easy. Just show the scriptures. I mean, if you want the scriptures, I'll, I'll show you the scriptures. You know, I was talking to Minister Ken this morning. I knew this was going to come up. I tried not to let it up, but... And uh, we were talking about types and shadows and pictures of the Old Testament. And if you go to the Old Testament, every type and shadow and picture leads to the shadow caster, Jesus. Every last one of them. And uh, 
I went back to Genesis 14 because Genesis 14 is the thing that people use to say that it's okay for you to still be under the bondage of tithing, okay, because Abraham tithed before the law. I know that. I taught half of them that. <laughs> yeah. But then if you look at Genesis 14 very carefully, you see a type Jesus, yeah. Melchizedek. Jesus is our Melchizedek. Yeah. You see him bringing the bread and the wine. And the Bible says in the New Testament, this is my body, bread, which was broken for you. This is my blood, wine, still leads to Jesus. And then the fact that Melchizedek was there in the first place was unmerited. It was grace. Where you come from? He just popped up in the picture, praise God. And, and then, then Melchizedek sits down and explains to him all of his goodness. It was God that did that. You won because of God who did this. And Abram was like, ooh, was so grateful and thankful for what God had done, he gave 10% of everything that he had won in that battle and did not forbid his allies to take what they had won. Somebody says, what you saying? Can't you see? He wasn't required to do that. He did that out of his heart. Mm, Y'all got to hear what I'm saying now. He did it out of his heart. Now, what is it that we do under the New Testament? What do we call it? Gracious giving? What do we call, what do we call it? Generous giving? They said that 10% that he gave of everything that he had won, that was, that was real generous. Guess what? That 10% points to generous giving in the New Testament because it's out of the heart that you give in the New Testament. And you see Abram giving out of the heart, not out of obligation. Tithing wasn't required by Abraham. It was out of the heart he gave out of appreciation. So you cannot say that I'm required to do something that based on what Abram did, when Abram did what he did, out of his heart not out of obligation or requirement. Everything pointed to Jesus. Everything pointed to Jesus. And what was it that was pointed to? Look at how generous he, look at how generous he has been to you. He died for you. He took on all your sins. He went to a hell you were supposed to go to. He, he died so you can die. He was raised from the dead so you can be raised from the dead. He was seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty so you can sit down there with him. He's coming back again for you. And you think, wait a minute, out of my heart, I am going to give cheerfully, not because you require me to, but I see all of your generosity that you've done to me, and out of my heart I give. And I don't understand why people can't see that. <laughs> oh, except tithing still keeps your self-righteousness in, in the picture. You know how, how guilty we are of something called self-righteous giving? That's a type of giving that makes us feel that what we did is going to be enough to get a blessing. We still don't believe Jesus was enough to bless us. We still got to have something that we can do to say I'm blessed because I did A, B, C instead of I'm blessed. Now remember, Abram was blessed before he gave 10%. He was already rich, and he was already blessed because he just won that battle. And he gave a 10% out of gratitude for what he already had. Not like they teach today, give a 10% and then you'll get blessed. Yeah. Yeah. And it still wasn't no money being exchanged. It was still, you read it, stock, animals. But Jesus says, you tithe. He was talking about spices. I'm not letting go of it. I, I kind of backed off of it a little bit. Forget that. 
The whole point of it is this. Everything points to life. Everything points to Jesus. Jesus is the only one that can, he, he's the only, the only one that can give you life. I don't care what you do based on what somebody else did. The whole picture of Genesis 14 was, you're going to get a new high priest. And he's going to be better than this high priest, Melchizedek. And go to Hebrews in 7, it compares the ministry of Melchizedek to the high priest of Jesus Christ. And he says, they, they bought tithe to Melchizedek, but you're going to give out of your heart to Jesus because of the generous way that he has treated you. Yeah. Everything leads to Jesus, the shadow caster. Yeah. Yeah. But many Christians are satisfied with serving the shadows. And Hebrew 10 talks about, what, verse 1? Pull it up. Talks about, uh, uh, you know, uh, these are the shadow of things. Yeah. It mentions shadow, you know, over and over again. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the thing. We got the very image. Yeah. It can never with those sacrifices which they offer year by year continually make the comer thereunto perfect. We have the shadow caster. Well, what day y'all have church on? Saturday or Sunday or Friday? <laughs> it ain't about a day no more because Jesus is our Sabbath. Amen. Jesus is our Sabbath. <sighs> but we're so self-righteous conscience. We just got to keep ourselves in the, mi in the mix because we don't think Jesus is enough. And that's the truth. You don't think he's enough. So you keep coming up with mixtures. You, 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 say, yeah, I trust, you say Jesus is enough, and then you mix it with, with a principle. We've been peddling principles because a principle says, if you do this, then that'll happen. Jesus is my principle. He's, he's the one who I trust. And if you trust him and believe in him and believe in that new creation on the inside of you, he does a work in you and with you you can't do. Because you're not dealing with the letters on stone. You're dealing with the word made flesh. And he gives you glory. And you're about to see an acceleration of the glory that he gives. And if you're not satisfied with the glory that you're seeing, you still probably got some of you still in the way. I was online the other, other morning, and I just made my mind up. That's it. I'm finna let her, I'm finna let her rip. People gonna talk about you anyway, so I'm gonna give them something to talk about. And the Apostle Paul said, whether they preach it for gossip or whether they preach it at church, it's being preached. Y'all right. hear what Crello said the other night <laughs> about the tithe? What you really mean is, y'all hear what Crello said the other night, messing with our money again? <laughs> I trust Jesus. <laughs> Some of y'all sitting here, <laughs> what, what do we do with this? What do we do with this? Prosper. <laughs> Jesus is your prosperity. Jesus is your healing. Jesus is your righteousness. Jesus is your holiness. Jesus is your deliverer. Jesus is your redeemer. Jesus is your wisdom. Jesus is your everything. <laughs> Don't you see? He is the main star. We don't need no supportive actors. Yeah. Ain't no supportive roles. He is, he got the role. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Ooh, I got to calm down. I'm, I'm, I, I preach myself happy. I got to go back and say, oh, Lord, what did I say? What did I say? But, I mean, Jesus even said, he said, those scriptures that y'all looking at, all of them, you know what Jesus said? They speak of me. Yeah.
And it's amazing to me how we took this gigantic, wonderful, beautiful signpost that pointed to Jesus and only picked out the word tithe. Seriously? Talking about a new high priest, talking about bread and wine, talking about the coming of Jesus, talking about the generosity Jesus is getting ready to do, and we could only pick out, well, <laughs> Abram tithed before the law, so it's a principle. And what you're saying is, so you going to have to do just what he did. That's why you can't hardly read not, because you, you're not, you don't know how to read. <laughs> you don't know how to read. I mean, it, let, let me just say this one thing, and I'm going to be through with it. If this was such an issue, you mean to tell me, out of the main issues in the Bible, God interrupts the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus. And the people that were with him said, we heard. I, 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 I did something today. I, I, Ken, after you left in the morning, I went and got my Bible. And I said, oh, they saw the light, but, but Paul was the only one who heard the voice. And then I kept reading Scripture, and it said, and everybody else heard the voice. They didn't see nobody, but they heard the voice. I said, God, dog, is here. Religion had me preaching one of them little sermons. Oh, hallelujah. They saw the light, but only Paul heard the voice. And the scripture said, you know, everybody heard the voice right now. So I ain't listening. I ain't got nobody to say. If I can't see it and read it for myself, I want to hear all that. It sounds good. He saw the light, but only Paul heard. Heard the voice. <laughs> see, some of you who are going through right now, <laughs> it's because you can only see the light, <laughs> but you can't hear the voice. <laughs> oh, loud. <laughs> you need to hear the voice. <laughs> and right there, I said, and everybody heard the voice. <laughs> I said, God, dog. <laughs> God, dang. I'm like, this is, this is ridiculous. And then you, then you go to Hebrews 7, and you read in Hebrews 8, and he tells you, here is the whole entire purpose for what I just said. So you'll see the high priest of this new covenant. But again, we picked that. See, they gave some money. So I need to get y'all, I need you to get y'all a principle so y'all can do that. See, because I'm going to have to, I need you to do. And you've got to teach people how to do what they do out of their heart. If it ain't coming out your heart, the New Testament is all about what comes out of your heart. God wants, God wants it out of your heart, not out of your obligation or service, but your heart. And if you're doing it out of your heart, you're going to start behaving right, talking right, acting right, living right, doing everything right, giving right, because it's coming out your heart. But when you go back to the letter on stone, it killeth, and it cannot give you life. Now, I said it. Take that viral. I don't care. <laughs> Jesus is coming soon, and this glory is getting manifesting soon, too. When sin abound, grace does much more abound. You think devil gonna, God going to let the devil just be the only one showing out? Are you kidding me? When sin abounds, grace does much more. And grace is a person, does much more. Jesus is getting ready to do much more. So as crazy as it gets, as it gets out there, you ought to start smiling because Jesus is getting ready to do much more. Y'all, you hear what I'm saying? I don't look like I'm going to finish part three tonight. It's it just much more. Much more. When sin abounds, much more does grace abound. Amen. Ooh, Jesus. Ooh, Jesus. When grace is taught, 
truth also must be demanded in the lives of those who are under grace, is what people say. You listen to that grace stuff, you got to get the truth too now. They treat it like they're two separate things. Grace is the truth. Grace is what produces truth. You, in fact, you can't have no truth without grace. Did you hear what I said? There's no truth without grace. Because the truth came to give grace. Ain't no truth without grace. Well, I preach the truth. You preach grace? No, I don't preach that. You ain't preaching the truth. There can't be no truth without grace. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. You know, the word says grace and truth. It's the same thing. <laughs> there is never, ever going to be a separation from grace and truth. Never. But religious people have you thinking that. And that is not so. This thought is, it's, it's fallacious. Let me use that word. What does that mean? It's based on a mistaken belief. Grace and truth will always be together. Grace and truth are inseparable. They do not appear apart from each other. Grace does not demand truth. It produces truth. It's not correct to say that grace is God's part and truth is man's part. Both are of God. <laughs> when God in grace deals with man, he produces truth in man. And you'll know the truth. And it'll make you free from the law. Yeah. 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 Yeah, if you know the truth, and the truth will make you free. From what? <laughs> For what? Truth will make you free from them drugs. No, no, no. No, no. Grace is the truth. And once you get grace, which is the truth, you can be free from everything. Because grace is the truth that makes men free. Look at Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 13. Titus 2, 11 through 13. For the grace of God that bringeth what? Salvation, the truth of salvation, has appeared to all men. It's appeared to all men. <clears throat> what is grace doing? Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, it'll teach us to live soberly. It teaches us to live righteously. It teaches us to live godly. Those are all the things we were trying to get on our own by keeping the law. He says, grace will teach you how to live godly. Grace will teach you how to live righteous. But if you don't think Jesus is enough, you're still going to be trying to do this on your own. Verse 13, and grace will also teach you to look for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace teaches that. Grace teaches that. Grace may well be defined as God's abounding provision. And it abounds, when something abounds, it increases. God's abounding provision in love for those who depend on him. Grace is God's abounding provision. Now, provision in two areas. Provision... Uh, to justify the one who believes in Jesus. Number one, there's provisions to justify the one who believes in Jesus, just as if you've never sinned, justification. And then provision for a life of truth in the one who is justified. And so this comes by grace, to be justified and then to have a life of truth for the ones who, who are justified. So let no one think of grace apart from truth. You can't think of grace apart from truth. And equally as important, let no one think that there can be truth without grace because grace offers free pardon for sin and the law demands righteousness. Okay? And then there are people who, again, will say that grace is going to lead people to careless living. It won't. And that's what people are afraid. You're, you're already living careless. You're living careless now. Careless living. You, you, that's what you're doing now, trying to, trying to keep the law. Mm hmm Right? Uh. The law. 
doesn't produce truth. It reveals what? Sin. Which is error and failure. Look at Romans 6, 14. I think I have time to stick a little in this. Y'all give me about five more minutes. Yeah. Set that clock for five more minutes there, Keith. Let me have five more. Let me have six and a half minutes, Keith. About six. There you go. Six and a half minutes. Uh, Romans 6, 14. Now, listen to this. The law cannot produce the slightest bit of truth in man. I mean, when you talk about the comparison between the law to grace, this is the age old conflict of legalism and grace. Look what he says here. And this is what the book of John is about. It, you, you see that comparison between Jesus and Moses, the law and grace. You see it through the entire book of John. He says, for sin shall not have dominion over you. For you're not under the law, but you're under what? Grace. So she, sin shall not have dominion over you. Now notice what else he says here. Under the law, sin has dominion over you. Now, please, I don't want you to get, you, I don't want you to get this idea in your head. Oh, the law is devilish and stuff. No, 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 no. The law is perfect. The law came from God, but you're imperfect. And your imperfection, trying to keep something that is perfect, produces sin. It, you can't do it. And, and when you realize you can't do it, it produces condemnation. And it produces shame. And it produces everything. And you, you, don't, you don't have life in that. I, 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 I want to, in this cycle, continue to say to people, like Paul said in Romans, the law is good says the law is perfect. The problem is men are not. So this, the, the beauty of, of, about Jesus, he says, I gave you something, it was, it was perfect. I did it on purpose because when I came down from the mountain and told y'all what needed to happen, y'all just stood up ar arrogantly and said, we can do everything you say. You still thinking you can do this by yourself. So, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you something perfect. Do that by yourself. Now, talk to me in 2,000 years. Do that by yourself. Okay? But I love you, and so I am going to wrap myself up in flesh. The idea of who I am will be made known to man. I'm going to give you a new covenant through my blood. We're going to find a way to get rid of your old nature, and I'm going to give you my nature, and I'm going to seal what I give you in the Holy Ghost. And what you have in new nature cannot sin. It is perfect and it is heaven ready. It is what is going to come out of your body when you die. You are one third perfect. Now start renewing your mind, it starts lining up with the perfection of your new creation. I can't hardly talk about this stuff, but it is. The perfection of your new creation. And then when you, when, the more you renew your mind and yielding to that new creation, your body just going to do what it's told to do. Your body right now operates on, on sin impulses from a software that has not yet been completely renewed. You see? Uh, yeah, man. So I'm not under, now that I'm born again, and nobody could get born again until Jesus made that available. Nobody could get born again. And that's why he can trust you to give out your heart. Because your this is good. I, 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 let, me, let me take a breath. I just bumped into this right now. This is good. Somebody say it. I'm going to say it. Oh, this is good. You have a new creation on the inside of you. It is flawless. It is perfect. Okay? So you can now trust your new nature in giving. You don't need nobody to give you no rules because you have you got a new nature a perfect nature, yes. and what you do out of that nature is always going to be right. Yes. And, and that nature is also going to help you to love right. Yes. You don't need five rules of how to love right. You're going to love right. You're going to love your husband right. You're going to love your wife right. Yes. Because the more you renew your mind to yield to that perfect part of you, yes. that's God. You understand? Yes. 
Do you understand? You're in there with God. In Him we move. In Him we breathe. You're in there. Your spirit, the new creation, is in God. You have the faith of Jesus Christ. It's in Him. So out of Him, you can trust everything because it's coming, it's coming from a perfect place. I don't expect nobody to understand me tonight except the crew. Everybody else online, I think probably have gone by now. Like, what? What are, you talking, what, what, what are you talking about? They smoking weed in that church? Well, we smoking something that ain't weed. We smoking the glory, praise the Lord. We smoking the presence, praise the Lord. And the fight is you think you need rules. Do you understand? The Ten Commandment is God's character. It was so perfect. It was so flawless. But surrounded by a bunch of rules to see if they can produce morality in your life, it failed miserably. So not because it's devilish. It's because you don't have a soul that will line up with your new creation. Well, no, before then, you didn't have a new creation. So Jesus had to do this so he you, you didn't have it. You already proved it. Man didn't have it. He made him, and he, he didn't have it. The boy, the boy would bring his sacrifices on the way home, sin again. It was in nature. He just, he just gave the priest a sacrifice. He would cover for two minutes. Now he got to wait a whole year to come and do it again. Man didn't have it because he had the nature to sin. He couldn't help it because that was his nature. Yeah. And people who are not born again, they have a nature to sin. Don't look at the world like, look at them fools, what's going on? They're just doing what they have a nature to do. And Jesus said, I want to make available to everybody who don't like their nature. I got a new nature. It's the new creation. It's flawless. It's perfect. I'm in there. I'll seal you with the Holy Ghost. You won't be able to sin. It's going to give you impulses to do right. And every time you do something wrong with this new nature, you ain't going to feel like you used to feel when you had that old nature. Go out and do something with this new nature and see don't they talk to you all night long. See don't you twitch and start telling on yourself. Because the new nature is trying to get you to live according to that godly perfection on the inside of you. You have a nature to live righteous. You got born again. You have a nature. So that's why God is not sending people to hell when your behavior is still out of whack. It's coming together. You just got the right tool. Now you're renewing your mind. And, 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 and you do stupid stuff, but now you got new nature that's convicting you and trying to convince you that ain't your nature no more. That's what the Holy Ghost is doing to you. That's not you. And you're going to say, yes, it is. It used to be me. Go out and do it again. That's not you. And then you realize you ain't even getting high no more. You're like, I don't even know where, the, where is the high. It ain't there no more. I done drunk three bottles, and I still ain't drunk yet because that's not you. And then you're going to encounter that love. And the day you encounter that love and it break you down, you're going to say, that's not me. And the Holy Ghost will say, that's what I've been trying to tell you. I get it. It took me a long time to get it, y'all. Now, I've been doing this 42 years. It took a minute, but I got it. And I'm trying to accelerate the teaching so you can get it a lot sooner and get it to your family and get it to your friends and get it to people who have fallen down and they don't want to get up no more and tell them, come on, get on up. You can be all right because God's forgiven you. That's not no nature. He's working on you. You're going to be all right. He promised that the work will be finished with you on the day that he returns. That's his promise, not yours. I know what you're thinking. This sounds too good to be true. That's exactly what the gospel is. It is the too good to be true news. The almost too good to be true news. That's what this is. And that's what I made my mind up to, to teach radically. 
No more easing in no more. Freaking radical. <laughs> radical until you think something wrong with me. When the whole time something is so absolutely right, I finally get it because I now can behold the Lamb. I see him. Word made flesh. You know what we saw? You know what, you know what they saw when they, when, they, when they first saw Jesus? Glory. They saw the manifestation of God. So you know what he put on the inside of us? This new creation? You know why he put that on us? He's going to start manifesting in our lives, watch this, glory. I'm telling you, this glory is about to accelerate, and you won't be able to take credit for it. The glory's coming. Somebody says it's here. The glory's coming. I said the glory's coming. It's going to invade your house. It's going to invade your family. It's going to invade your finances. It's going to invade your physical body. It's going to invade your emotions. There's going to be manifestations of that new creation in every area of your life. And we will all become extremely radical together. Some of you, gonna, when you get this, you, you're, it's going to be hard to stand before sickness and knowing you got all this in you. For you even ask, mm, in the name of Jesus. Yeah. You ain't got to be scared no more. You ain't got to pretend no more. You ain't got to like, well, I ain't worthy no more and stuff like that. You getting rid of the, you been, you're going to go with the flow. That anointing, people think it's going to come from the pulpit. It's coming from the congregation come from the congregation. I, I've been going out here to the West Coast and get real radical. Real radical. Real radical. So, y'all hear me hollering because my dad helped me now. The glory is intensifying with frequency. You hear me? Frequently. Frequently seeing the glory. All right. All right.